The collector Ferrari market is unlike anything else on this planet in that there are multiple tranches. And I use that term very specifically because it's both financially motivated and segmented. For example, you look at the road cars that Ferrari made their bones on, stuff like 250 short wheelbase, 250 TDF. These are no longer collector cars in terms of value. These are art in terms of value to the point where either one of those would make that 300 SL Gullwing we recently drove look like a pittance. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's really no nice way to put this, there are overgrown Fiats that are more expensive to maintain than to buy. And then there's this, the forgotten Ferrari. And this, it's so important to the history of Ferrari road cars, it is often overlooked because it sits between two incredibly iconic cars from Ferrari. And yes, they were iconic for the cars that they were, the Daytona and the 85 Testarossa, but I would argue those two cars were iconic because they represent the ages in which they were developed. So today, we are going to circle back to the forgotten Ferrari and better understand why it's so important to Ferrari. Not exactly a 300 SL Gullwing, but there still is something special about getting one of these things moving, and that is the clutch. Uh, you need to be either a distance runner or a gym rat to work that clutch because it is stiff, doesn't even begin to describe it, but there's an additional problem in that it is literally an on-off switch. There is a point at which the clutch is engaged and it is disengaged. There is no elegance to it. So what you need to do is you need to use your ankle as like a pivot point, almost like a hinge on the floor of the car to be able to get the thing moving forward. So let me try to demonstrate without stalling the car. So first gear, dog leg, five speed transmission. Uh, let's get this thing rolling and here we go. Oh, I didn't stall it. There we go. It actually worked. That's after some practice. It took me something like an hour to get used to that clutch driving this thing around the neighborhood before I was confident enough to switch on the cameras to demonstrate the usability of this clutch. Whether you like these or not, let's get the important history of these out of the way right at the top. This is the first Ferrari road car to have the engine mounted like that, meaning a mid-mounted engine in a car for the avoidance of doubt that has a Ferrari badge on it. Now there is some other confusion about this because when you think of the name, this is a 512 Berlinetta Boxer injected, uh, the original one, 365 Berlinetta Boxer. Uh, that is not a Boxer engine. Uh, that is a flat, 180 degree flat 12. And we can get into crank pins and journals, but the big difference here between a boxer, it's a 180 degree crank, meaning it's a flat plane crank like you have in a Mustang GT350. This is a 120 degree crank, meaning it looks like a triangle where a 180 degree crank would sit flat on a table. The difference is a boxer, and the reason why they call them a boxer, is the pistons on each bank go out simultaneously. This does not do that, hence this is not a boxer. However, it was still otherworldly power of its day. Uh, this one, 360 horsepower, 333 pounds of torque. There is certainly a pageantry to the sound, isn't there? This is early 80s, so anything you want as long as it's rear wheel drive, which is an incredibly good thing. Wish more companies did that today. And then there's the whole concept of, oh my God, it's an old Ferrari, it's gotta be fast, or it's an old muscle car, it's gotta be fast. Uh, quick. I wouldn't call it fast. Let's circle back to this whole forgotten Ferrari aspect about this thing. It was originally introduced as a concept car, show car, in Turin in 1971. Then Ferrari showed the production intent 365 GT4 BB at Paris in 1973. And yes, we already covered the historical significance as it relates to Ferrari road cars about where that engine is placed. But keep in mind, the engine was longitude and there was a five-speed manual transmission in 1973 that all worked together to lower the center of gravity of the thing. It was a technological tour de force for anything, not just Ferrari, when you consider the time. Uh, they built 
the 365 GT4 BB from 73 to 76. That was 380 horsepower carbureted engine. And then from 76 to 81 was the 512 BB, still carbureted. And then 81 to 84 was this, 512 BBI. So still had the same 5 liter flat 12, but it had the Bosch fuel injection. Interestingly though, it had less horsepower than the carbureted car back in 73, 74. It was 20 less horsepower. Now I would say it had something to do with the emissions, but remember, these cars never came to the US officially. And there's an old wives tale, depending on where you look on the internet. Uh, it is rumored that Enzo did not want to send the car to the US because of 55 mile an hour speed limits and choked emissions. If you think about it, I really can't disagree with them. The age of this car has a huge impact on the driving dynamics because it's almost a modern day car, which means it's kind of a facsimile of mid-engine cars that you and I drive today. However, big caveat, you needed to be a better driver back in the day to push this thing to its limits. And that's not a function of lack of driver's age. That's kind of the easier cheater answer here. It's really a function of this was the first road going mid-engine Ferrari. So not everything was sorted, even what is this 10 years on from when the car was introduced. And the big things you notice are there's virtually no lateral movement. Side to side, it's almost flat. The biggest thing you notice is lightness in the nose because after all, it is a mid-engine car and it's 12 cylinders out back. So I gotta believe the weight distribution ain't great here. So you do notice a little bit of twitch in the steering, especially on less than perfect pavement like we're on now. But this is just one of those experiences where you wanna be like six, maybe seven tenths. But that's about it. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play our newest game, Options Game Senior, where we go through the original pricing, if it's still available, of the classic cars that we feature in our retro drive reviews and compare them to the current values as stated by the man who literally writes the book on classic car values, our good friend Dave Kinney. So let's dive right into today's contestant, the 1983 Ferrari 512 BBI, which had a base price in Europe of $62,500. Remember, these were never sold officially in the US, so you had to buy it there, bring it here, and really the only option was to federalize it, which really wasn't an option. Figure that was about $10,000. So the landed price of this vehicle in the good old US of A was $72,500. Now that sounds like a lot of money back in the day, and yes it was, because that's equivalent to $186,629 today. Put another way, the average price of a new car in 1983 was $10,607, or in $2020, $27,304. But I'll admit 186 grand is indeed multiples of 27 grand. However, there's a caveat with that. If we were to go back to the first real year of production of these things, 74, that was $35,000 in Europe. And for giggles, let's use the same 10 grand federalization, so 45 grand in the US. If we were to take that same amount of money from 74 and turn it into $20,20, it would be almost 260 grand. So this was a bargain by the time you hit 1983. And this was in a year, 74, the average price of a car was $4,050, which was $23,000 today. But the real important number is what does Dave say it's worth? Well, if this were a bucket of bolts, didn't run, condition for a car, it'd be worth about 170,000. This one is somewhere between uh, a condition two and a condition one car. It, the paint is beautiful. The interior is beautiful. There are no dents on this whatsoever. The wheels are perfect. It, it, he's calling a condition two car $248,000 and a condition one car 300 grand. Let's say safely this is 275. But wait, there's more. There's always more with Dave. If we go back to that same, 260 grand car from 1974. That car goes anywhere between 330,000 and 535,000. The definition of literally less, in this case carbureted, is more. 
Let's go back to the transmission, talk about it specifically, not the clutch. Dog leg five speed, a couple of interesting things going on here. Number one, obviously it's a Ferrari. It has the gated shifter. Please bring that back. Uh, number two, first gear is super low, like pulling tree stumps kind of low. Then the other thing that's really interesting is most people, when these things are cold, go into third gear, not second gear. And the reason why is second gear is also a really, really low gear, but third, is it's, it's so wide, it can pull even up this hill. Not very quickly, but not to the point where the engine bombs. Now here's another use case. Say we want to downshift at the second. I found it is much easier to double clutch this kind of transmission and get it into second. The transmission is much more, at least that gear is much more accepting of the gear change, but let's put aside the lower gears and try something a bit higher up in the rev range. Not exactly the best road for it. Third gear, really wide, usable around town. I would say you're gonna use two and three around town. Fourth is more for divided highways, dual carriageways, that kind of stuff. Fifth, this is more of an overdrive gear, something you use on freeways, motorways, express Place, where you're really getting the thing above, I'd say at least 70 miles an hour. So a topic that is important to all Ferraris, not just this Ferrari prior to say the year 2000, and that is seating position. Uh, to give you an idea of reference, I am six foot tall. I have longer legs than my torso. Not ideal seating in this thing. Uh, you feel like you literally are in the proverbial go-kart because you are pushed forward. Like my head is at the top of the windshield. That is not a normal occurrence for someone my height. Uh, your legs are very much underneath the front of the car. I wouldn't call it a comfortable car to drive. I wouldn't call it supportive seating. I wouldn't even call it ergonomically correct. What I would call it is the Italian's attempt at trying to fit somewhat normal sized human beings into a sports car. They've gotten significantly better at it. This is not one of their better examples. But I will say one thing interesting about this one. God, that headliner, if you're gonna hit it, it is an elegant headliner to hit. It's like a Burberry coat, the inside of a Burberry coat. And this one was just refinished by the owner, complete with the detailing of the edge of the sun visors finished in leather. Really something stunning. But that said, I can't see, so put this back. switch on the air conditioning. Yes, this is fitted with air conditioning. So let's put the window up here. And that indeed takes a while. Okay, that's done. I have it over to max on the temperature, meaning max cold, and it is a three-speed fan. Air conditioning in an early 80s Ferrari. Um, I am literally sweating my balls off, but I will tell you that is about as effective as Luigi the mouse blowing on an ice cube. So two very interesting Ferrari aspects to this thing. Number one, the horn. There is no horn quite like something that was from a late 60s to I wanna say mid 80s Ferrari. That is a horn that commands attention. And number two, you cannot open the glove box by pushing it or a handle or anything like that. There is a button that is here, and that opens the glove box. Think of it as like a trap door for your passengers. While we're on the topic of things that open the doors, upon initial investigation, there doesn't seem to be a door handle anywhere here. This literally is a handle. All you do is hold on. There's nothing down here except for an ashtray. So how do you open the doors? Well, that would require a bit more investigation because Enzo himself hid the door handle up here. Uh, it's a little like release. Only one finger is needed. You would pull this and it would open up the door. Don't really want to play Jeep in a Ferrari. So close that. And that is pretty much an exhaustive list of the weirdness of the interior of 
the 512 BBI. Let's dive into the history of this specific car surrounding 162. And as we already discussed in Options Game Senior, these were never officially imported into the U.S. through Ferrari North American channels back in the day. They were all gray market. And in doing a bit of research, I learned that more than a couple of the original owners took the folks who were doing the DOT EPA certifications to the side and said, hey man, while you're in there, can you throw in a couple of turbos? Thinking 360 horsepower wasn't enough in a mid-engine Ferrari back in the early 80s. I've driven this thing pretty extensively. That wasn't a good idea. And apparently the second owner, they seem to agree because this car was already in stunning condition. Very low mileage car, it only has 22,000 original miles. So they wanted the engine to match. So they sent it to this Mark expert and they completely rebuilt the engine, but ran into a problem. All of the air intake pieces, the stuff underneath those slats there in the back of the engine bay, none of that stuff exists anymore. So they had to get the schematics from the factory and the Mark expert literally crafted it from hand, even down to the Prancing Horse logo and the Ferrari script written out, which has turned out to be nothing short of artwork. But rather than spiral down that rat hole, let's switch gears and discuss the current caretaker. He is a fellow pilot, has a two-person version of that Warbird over there, and has done a couple of things over the five years he's owned it. Uh, completely redid all the leather on the interior, not just the seats, but the red insets, as well as the belts that hold, I guess, fitted luggage. Completely redid the headliner. And then the thing I'm most proud of him for, while it is in really good shape, it's not a garage queen. This has 22,000 original miles we already discussed. He has been responsible for over 20% of that.